Okay, well, thank you very much, Dana, and um, welcome to the Tyndall Seminar. I'm kind of nervously excited, I think, because um, I think what I'm talking about today, although it kind of relates partly to the work that I do in my research, it kind of also relates to something that's very much my passion and is a bit of a hobby um, and is kind of something I like to do in my spare time. I'm not sure what that says quite about me. Um, but it, it's about um, looking at, at arts and culture, but looking at taking kind of science engagement and conversations about climate change kind of away from spaces like this one, where everyone's kind of sat down staring at someone like me talking at a screen, and kind of into, into different spaces, into museums, into art galleries, kind of onto the street, and to kind of, yeah, sort of bring climate change hopefully to, to the here and now. So what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to kind of give a bit of a background where um, I will shamelessly plug the work of lots of colleagues who very much, um, I think what's really interesting now is the way that uh, s kind of climate change and science engagement is now informed increasingly by research and it's kind of by looking at that research and understanding and kind of reflecting on that and incorporating that into the ways that we do kind of climate change and other types of engagement that, that really um, is, is sort of very exciting. So I'm going to give some background on that and then I'm going to talk about two, um, two things that I've been involved in. Um, I think if I was going to give a maybe a top five of the three best things I've ever done at work, then two of these things are in that top five. So, um, so it's quite personal, this presentation, and I hope that, um, that you kind of, that you enjoy it. So why do we do this? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with kind of the slight, you know, the kind of, I suppose, the primary motivation for, for many of us who work in this area. It's kind of why why are we doing, you know, why do we do engagement? And that graph kind of shows it all. That actually, um, despite kind of decades of supposed sort of policy interest and policy concern about climate change and climate mitigation, um, emissions continue to rise. And what we're increasingly understanding is the, um, is the new research on, on climate impacts, so the publication of the IPCC's report on 1.5 degrees really kind of laid out quite starkly how every half a degree matters, so actually in terms of impacts on the natural environment, impacts on biodiversity, impacts on, on people, that actually that shift from like one and a half degrees to cli of climate change to two degrees of climate change has a massive, you know, is massive in terms of the impacts and with every kind of half a degree, whilst it might not sound like very much in terms of those those kind of broader impacts the the impacts are massive so i think that's why so many people are you know are kind of driven you know, to sort of work in this space um when we're trying to engage people on climate change this is from the european social survey which was done last year partly involving tyndall center colleagues at the university of cardiff and we can see that you know across I'm going to say the across Europe and associated countries. Let's let's leave it at that for now. Um, that there's that kind of you know we're looking generally at a kind of you know 90 plus probability sort of 90 percent of people say that the climate is probably or definitely changing, and that similar kind of similar figures are saying kind of agree that those changes are partly due to at least to human activity, and kind of lower numbers think those impacts will be bad but you know you can see that that generally speaking there is there is kind of concern about climate change amongst kind of you know you everyday people um, so this is just so if you're not someone who kind of works in this area or, or hangs out with climate scientists or people who work in this area it kind of makes you wonder makes me sort of wonder and reflect on okay where do people you know, where do, where do people find out about climate change and environmental change? So the, the top graph is um, produced uh, at the University of Colorado by a team run by someone called Max Boycott. And they, um, they chart across globally the, kind of, you know, the, the extent to which climate change is reported within the media. So this top chart is showing the UK um, and the kind of what tends to happen with climate change reporting is that something happens. It could be a kind of floods or heat waves or a policy announcement. And you kind of you get this sort of trigger, this kind of 
you know, it's, it's the way that sort of bad, the media follows bad news. You can, if you get this, this kind of peak of excitement, peak of interest, and then when we, the, our collective memory kind of forgets about that, the kind of media moves on to look at other things. I'm always struck, so the, the graph at the bottom, which might be a bit unclear, is showing kind of UK newspapers by circulation. So if you compare the two, we might think, oh, actually, um, the Guardian and the Observer kind of report quite consistently on environmental change, on climate change. But when we're, that's the Guardian and the Observer in terms of the kind of the circulation and the readership amongst the UK press. So actually, the spaces in which these stories tend to be reported are not necessarily those forms of media which most people or you know the largest number of people in the UK uh, use and engage with. Just so again some, um, some of the stories that we the, you know the visions of climate change that we get um, Britain's in meltdown but at least Vanilla Camilla and Dame Judy keep their cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not much more I can say about that, I don't think. Um, it's quite, uh, I don't know if people who kind of follow in, in this sort of in this area, it doesn't quite show. So I think at the end of last year, the BBC had been kind of criticised quite extensively for um, <coughs> the biased nature of some of their reporting on climate change, which then led to the BBC being issued with guidelines for how to, how they should be reporting on climate change. Um, that was what I wanted to point. The, this is just taken from Twitter. So it's a Tyndall colleague. Stuart, um, Capstick at, at Cardiff is now doing um, BBC Climate Watch. <laughs> and so every day, uh, Stuart and colleagues, they just kind of look on the BBC website to have a look to see in this new kind of era of open reporting on climate change, the extent to which climate change is being reported by the BBC. And again, I think this was a Oh, climate watch from the 22nd of January and so you can see that um, yeah that, that climate change still isn't particularly um, isn't particularly appearing in oh, yeah, I mean the example of the BBC website so I think this is one of the you know this kind of it's bringing climate change to people I think is is partly one of my you know my big drivers for, for doing this so when we're looking at engaging people with climate change, um, so it's widely acknowledged to, yeah, as a pressing social and complex societal challenge. And we also know very much the solutions are as much, if not more, social, economic and political as they are technical. Because at, at the end of the day, if we look at you know, low carbon electricity supply, for example, we've had these technologies for kind of... Um, for, for tens of years and, and the fact that um, that mitigation that isn't happening that emissions aren't reducing particularly isn't because we don't know from a technical perspective how to do it it's the fact that we don't know from a from a social or from an economic or from a political perspective how to do it and just showing those images there it kind of so people you and me and, and our families and our friends we, we have many different roles to play within this technology transition because it is going to be a huge transformation um, in technology and the way we live our lives. Um, you know, we might have to, we, we could, we'll be adopting, using new technologies in our homes. We'll be using different electricity, which is produced in different ways, in different kinds of ways. We might have electric vehicles, we might have smart meters, we might be generating our own electricity and then storing that in batteries and, and using new technologies. Increasingly, we may be looking at having to, to change our diets, to travel in different ways, to travel less. And so this, this low carbon transition and many of the changes that are, are required are, are kind of transformational. Um, and we're going to play different roles, as, as I said, as technology adopters, as consumers, um, and hopefully as citizens and, and in a more political sense. But however, for many people, um, so climate change is, is complex, it's intangible, the, the causes are complex and the impacts, so I think this is increasingly less so, um, but certainly there used to very much be a um, a sense that the impacts are either are going to occur somewhere else 
um, either in, in uh, you know, a country far away from ours, to people who are not like us, or at some point in the future. Um, as I said, I think increasingly over the last sort of two or three years, we're seeing that changing as um, you know, we're, we're seeing more kind of extreme weather events that are very much being brought kind of through the media in, into our homes. Um, but very much this complexity can make it challenging for people to engage with or, or see the relevance of, of climate change to their own communities. So why do engagement? I think there's lots of, you know, lots of people have written about this, but um, I like the work of uh, Andy Sterling, who makes the argument that engagement is important. It's important for democracy. Um, it's important um, to support the making of better decisions. So it's through engagement and participation that different kinds of knowledge, local knowledge, can be brought into decision making. And, and sometimes uh, engagement is also done purely to get things through, so, uh, which you know, is a more instrumental, I suppose, rationale for engagement and not necessarily one I'm going to talk about here. Um, but I suppose the idea that makes, so this, um, People refer to the psychological distance of climate change, which is kind of what I kind of had up on my previous slides, is that idea that climate change is far away in time and in space and, to, and it happens to other people. And so through engagement, um, we can look at ways of making climate change closer, be that spatially, be that in time or be that socially. And through the ways that we engage with people, it's about... Um, helping people to understand their place within the climate change story. And ideally, I think the reason that many of us do this, it's because um, either we want to um, inspire a response, you know, so after you've kind of, you've been somewhere, you've maybe learned something about climate change, you might learn about some of the solutions, so that can um, change the way you do something in your home, for example, or, if not, at least it's providing a context and it's providing a background so that when um, other policy decisions come along, you've got, you know, that's, that's in the back of your mind. You, un you understand a bit of that background, a bit of that context, and it allows you to kind of to make sense of why a particular policy or why a particular change might be implemented, for example. So what makes for good engagement? And again, here I'm drawing shamelessly on the brilliant work that lots of um, Tyndall Centre and other colleagues have done. So I've talked a little about the kind of the overcoming of, of psychological distance. Um, and good engagement is engagement which supports dialogue with different kinds of audiences in a range of venues. And by dialogue, um, Things shouldn't be a, a kind of a one-way model of communication where, as an expert, I'm going to come and I'm going to tell you some useful and interesting things because I think that you don't know enough about this. You know, that's, that's a very... I think this idea of information deficit and that people make particular decisions because they don't know something is perhaps used to be a kind of a model of engagement but is increasingly not and so good engagement kind of promotes a two-way conversation it allows the people that you're engaging with to kind of to ask their questions and to kind of um to i suppose to put a face on you know to put uh in our workers as climate change you know working in this area it's about building up trust and and if you if there's a topic that you don't know much about, kind of being able to engage and discuss and ask questions and have that answered is part of that process of, of building trust in that science and building trust more widely. Um, yeah, we should be friendly communicators, not narrators of doom. Um, this could apply to some of my colleagues <laughs> more than others. <laughs> um, <coughs> but. Um, so I suppose it comes on to the idea that you have to, there's nothing worse than, than going to something and kind of and coming away with a feeling of, of hopelessness, of kind of, yeah, thinking that, that we're all doomed and that there's nothing we can do. So through our engagement, it's about um, inspiring hope, communicating solutions and empowering people to, to kind of to go away and implement those solutions. Um, the importance of emotions and values. I think this is, 
I'll talk a bit more about this on my next slide, but this is something that in marketing, market, people who do marketing know this. And that's the idea that we all, we all have beliefs, we all have values, um, all our values are different. And actually, depending on your values, different stories will, will make sense to you and fit with your worldview. And by having an understanding of who we're communicating to and what their beliefs and values are, we can start to tell um, we can start to tell the stories that resonate with people in ways that make sense to them, and then so yeah, narratives and stories and um, safe spaces to make emotional connections again. So this is about um, engagement in ways that kind of build trust and and yeah, providing that space. So this is just a, it's a, so this is a Schwarz's values. So the idea that we all, we all hold different values and um, that often, so people who hold environmental values, their values may fit more into this kind of, uh, to sort of, yeah, these, the sort of universalism corner, though it is possible to hold different types of values, so you can kind of hold universal values, but um, also be a hedonist, for example. It's just the fact that they're far away doesn't mean to say that you can't hold those particular values. Um, but there's been increasing research done now looking at what kinds of messages work with different kinds of audience. So if you're looking to engage um, with a, a right-wing audience, for example, on climate change or environmental change, you would tell a different story to the one that you would tell to a, a kind of a more left-wing or a liberal audience. And so the sto the sto your story um, for a more conservative audience may be less about future generations and the natural environment, but could be more around conservation and reducing waste and uh, sort of frugality, for example. So it's knowing your audience and kind of tailoring the story to that particular audience. So I'm now going to... I've probably done too much preamble. Um, kind of move on to uh, to sort of talk about these two um, sort of art and cultural engagements and why arts and culture. So, good colleague from the Tyndall Centre, Asher Mins, always finishes his um, present often finishes his presentations with a, a quote from Maya Angelou, which is, um, "People will forget what you tell them; they will forget what you show them." but they will never forget how, they, how you've made them feel. And I think this is, where, this is where kind of arts and culture comes into it because um, whilst some of us may kind of sit through a presentation and see some exciting graphs and think like, wow, um, most people aren't like that. So it's, it's, in <laughs> <laughs> it's, in like, it's in art galleries, it's through music, it's, it's through performance that actually those are the, the means in which you kind of, you know, they sort of, sort of feel a bit excited or the hairs on the back of your neck stand up or you kind of come away thinking like, wow, that was, that was an experience. And so it's through, so it's through these ways of engagement that you're trying to kind of, you know, to give that people that feeling. Um, so, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is the climate control exhibition, which was at uh, Manchester Museum in 2016 and so Hen, I won't point the pointer at you but so this was <laughs> so um, so sort of inspired and driven by by Henry and so we were very lucky to do a range of engagement activities as part of the exhibition. Uh, the exhibition was designed to to mix kind of interactivity and, and information um, and it was also designed with this kind of understanding of, of values in mind, so to kind of tell stories that fitted with you know, particular values. It was also um, planned to be the, the kind of the focal point for uh, different sets of engagement activities run by different groups. So in this respect, it, you know, it was really, really valuable because it kind of it, it provided a space it provided a set of resources and it it was an open invitation for different groups in Manchester and beyond to kind of run run their activities in in that particular space and so why I came on board and Tyndall Manchester came on board that part of the vision for the exhibition and the stuff that we did was to support the revision of Manchester's climate change strategy 
um, which was quite, you know, it's an exciting opportunity, or it felt like an exciting opportunity. Um, the thing about um, climate change governance now, I think, very much, is that it's not, you know, governance is kind of, it's, it's not something that happens at, at only one scale, it happens at different scales. You're kind of looking at bringing different kinds of stakeholders, different kinds of organisations, are all now involved in climate change governance because actually, um, yeah, you, you know, yeah, different people, different stakeholder groups have to be brought on board. And actually, climate change governance is very much a, it's kind of it's a process of building those links, building those coalitions, because that's what you need in order to kind of make change. So. I think this exhibition very much encompassed a lot of the things that I've been talking about. So um, it provided a space where people could tell their own stories and make sense of climate change together and hopefully a, a space for hope through the sharing of, of ideas and solutions. So what there was, what you can see here is the... Um, so that started the exhibition as a, as a black wall and there were um, thousands of, of moth stickers and so the idea through that was that people who visited there at the exhibition would kind of write down their reflections, write down their ideas and stick them, stick them on that wall so that you could come along to the exhibition, you could not only share your ideas but you could get ideas from other people and you could start to get that sense that actually you were, if you were concerned about climate change and wanted to make changes, you were actually, you were part of a bigger community within Manchester who were all kind of working and wanting to achieve the same thing. So to kind of give that sense of collective ownership over the problem and collective ownership over solutions and a sense of being part of something. Um, we also did a lot of activities that were, um, I suppose, to be fun, to be playful, to be kind of multi-sensory. So, for example, we, um, we did a run a series of, of events called Brick the City, where we uh, ran facilitated sessions where we invited people to come along um, and then build their version of the, like the city of Manchester, but um, which also met the objectives from the climate change strategy. So we were asking people to incorporate um, how would they put renewable energy into their Lego city, um, where would they put green and blue space, how would they kind of travel, what kind of community spaces would, would, they, would they like to see? So asking people to kind of, you know, to build their vision of what a, what a sustainable Manchester could be like as part of that, you know, to feed into that strategy. So there was also, um, I think this is important, um, a space to give climate change a face and a voice. Um, so <coughs> we ran a what were called climate conversations where uh, different uh, people from NGOs, different stakeholders, lots of people in this room took part in this. So you went along as someone who did something or knew something about climate change and you were, so you were in the exhibition and it was an opportunity to invite people to have a climate conversation. Um, and those conversations were about all sorts of things. I mean, I... <laughs> I was talking about, what was I talking about, carbon capture and storage. Um, other colleagues were talking about um, work on climate impact, different kinds of technology. And it's, it's to kind of build that idea of, of social trust, actually. So if you're talking, if people are unfamiliar with a lot of things about climate change, but they've had a conversation, then you become the face of that impact or the face of that technology. So that actually when you hear about that in the future, you're kind of remembering it not as something unknown, but as something that, you know, that Sarah or that Jace or that, that kind of Chris, it, you know, you become... That, that technology becomes associated with a person and the kind of the conversation that you had. Um, and two, two and a half thousand people had a, had a climate conversation. There was also a space, again, called Blue Skies Thinking, which was a space for sharing ideas, solutions and climate actions. Um, just thinking back to the moths, 12,000 moths were added to the Gather We Will together we all make a difference wall and at the start of the exhibition we'd had this idea that we were going to we were going to collate every single moth 
Um, and then after, after the first week, we realised that actually the moths were arriving so thick and so fast that there was no way that <laughs> we were ever going to be able to do this, apart from to take pictures about kind of how they, how they kind of changed and how the numbers built up. But what we did do is, uh, so there was 923 cards were added to the Blue Skies Thinking display. Um, of those 923, uh, there was 391, which had um, clear text that we were able to kind of code and, and note and mark down. Unfortunately, it was quite a high number, actually, 532 of them. <laughs> We couldn't do anything with, though they are still sat upstairs in my office. <laughs> um, and, and of those, 281 of the cards were f uh, kind of, could be clearly identified as being written by children, and 110 were kind of from adults or, or young people. So what we did um, with a sort of a, as a, a MACE undergraduate summer project within the school, so as we, we kind of we noted down and we analysed the kind of the themes that were emerging within these cards. And so <coughs> you can see here that in sort of nearly half of the, the ideas that were shared related to the natural environment, um, four percent to food, eleven percent to waste and, and so on. And that's just showing the kind of giving you a breakdown of that according to the proportion of um, child and adult responses you can see that so that's the ones related to the natural environment were kind of were predominantly given sort of shared by children um probably unex, unex you know it's not surprising that it was mainly adults who were sharing ideas related to policy um and we then kind of so here i'm now kind of mixing some of the the kind of the cards and the quotes with a, a breakdown of the, the kind of, you know, the ideas that were shared. So we can see that um, maybe due to the presence of the polar bear, which is what I <laughs> will come on to next, um, a lot of ideas were shared about um, animal conservation, for example. Um, there was ideas around, you know, I think a strong theme to emerge, which I was quite surprised, was I surprised? Yeah, I was surprised, um, was the idea of personal responsibility. So a lot of people were kind of, you know, we're being, you know, we have, there was a lot of kind of strong themes as, as we have to change, we have to do this. So in a sense, yeah, people were taking responsibility for climate actions themselves rather than, for example, calling for, calling on po politicians to take action or businesses to take action or kind of ideas around systemic change. S I suppose the strong, so themes probably not unexpectedly around, um, transport and, and more kind of local local actions and kind of personal measures that people could take. Um, and, uh, th yeah, this is just breaking, it's showing again the kind of the differences between the, the, adult, the responses from adults and the responses from children. And I think what I was particularly struck in this was um, was the way in which it was actually children who were more militant and children who were more angry, actually. Um, that there was kind of, from the cards, there was a very strong sense for, from young people, actually, that it wasn't, that, um, yeah, there was more anger and more militancy coming from young people than from, than from older people. Um, yeah, and people liked the polar bear. We then looked at how the ideas came from the cards, then related to sort of what is actually there in, in Manchester's climate change policy. And, and in many ways, there's a kind of, there's a slight mismatch. So the climate change policy is about uh, low carbon electricity. It's about transport policy around heating and, and industry as being the main sectors where we have to make reductions. But the kind of the narratives and, and what's coming from people is far more, it's around the natural environment, it's around waste. So, but it's, I think, primarily around the kind of the co-benefits, so the other things that energy gives us. Um, and that is where, I think, is the, the, valuable, the valuable thing to learn from this for policymakers, actually, is that 
if we want to reduce emissions, then the stories we should be telling shouldn't be around energy as such. They should be around the things that energy gives us and the other benefits that we get from reducing climate change and reducing our emissions. So, um, what's a good example of this? I suppose, let, let's, if we think about public transport or cycling. I, don't, I shouldn't be telling a, an energy story about public transport or cycling, but instead I can tell a story about improved air quality, which is healthier. I can tell a story around um, people travelling more actively, but also more slowly and being able to enjoy the kind of the environment in which they are. You know, it's about um, slower forms of travel, forms of travel that maybe improve the sociability of my streets, improve the sociability of my spaces, make my community feel like a nicer place to be because actually people aren't driving through it quickly in their cars, they're moving more slowly. And so it's those stories around kind of co-benefits which um, are potentially a, a more effective story to tell around kind of low carbon policies. Um, just some reflections on this. Um, I think what as well, what's interesting is that as children, when, when we're young, we don't need encouragement to play, but actually as we get older, we do. Um, and so it's, it was far harder to engage adults in interactive activities than it was for to engage children. But actually, what's interesting about museums as a space is that in muse museums are a space in which um, even adults allow themselves to learn. And so that's, I think that's an exciting opportunity um, that you can, if you're looking to do engagement, yeah, engaging in those kinds of spaces where kind of adults, we're, you know, we're less sort of tied up in the... the the preoccupied with our, our everyday lives, that in a way we're, we're opening ourselves out, opening ourselves up to learning, opening ourselves up to more different kinds of experiences. I am conscious that, I'm, that I've got so much to say and not much time to say it in, so I'm going to have to speed, well, move on. So now I'm going to talk about a second piece of, uh, sort of thing that I've been involved in, which was called um, Here and Now here and now change and so that was the the kind of the the sort of the piece of art that was kind of on the computer as people came in so this was something that um, I did with Tyndall colleagues from the University of Newcastle a research group at the University of Newcastle called Open Labs and then Future Everything who were a, a kind of Manchester um, arts organization and we worked with this with a digital artist called Dan Het. Um, and so what we were trying to do with Here and Now Change, with Here and Now, again, it was about engaging people with climate change, but we had a, it was using this kind of immersive digital artwork. We wanted to use objects from the museum's collections um, and stories and data. Um, and then we evaluated, wanted to evaluate how people engaged with, with our artwork. And this was shown on three separate occasions as part of the Great Exhibition of the North at the Great Hancock Museum in Newcastle. And we changed the artwork each time, sort of based on the feedback that people got, we got to kind of explore different things. Um, so yeah, this is what we were trying to do. We were trying to be poetic, not preachy. We wanted to encourage um, sort of slow and communal interactions so although we wanted it to, to be immersive we didn't want it to be an experience that people had with a, a headset for example we wanted people to be in the space and to kind of to experience the artwork collectively and together and to kind of to have the opportunity to um to take time as it were and so dan's ideas were around um, using 3D models of the ob of objects from the museum's collections that were then um, distorted in different ways. So they kind of, they dissolved and, and came back together again. And then the way, the rate at which that distortion happened was uh, kind of driven by particular sets of data that related 
to the object in question. Um, so these are that's the Oryx skull. So we um, we spent a few days uh, in the cellar in the cellars of the museum exploring the the collections with the different artists. And so we very much asked asked the the different curators of the different collections to kind of pick out for us their favourite objects from their collection, which told a story of environmental change, basically. So. Um, and then the objects that were selected in order to make the 3D models, they were either uh, 3D scanned or um, photometry was used. Um, and all know, I kind of, I know the words and I know what happened. I would have to, if you want to know the kind of the technical details, then I'd have to kind of put you in touch with the, our sort of our collaborators because they, they, did, they did all that stuff. Um, so what's that? That's a swallow-tailed butterfly. Um, and we then, so in order to tell the stories, we, we interviewed all the, the kind of curators and for each of the objects we were asking the curator, who are you? We were saying, what, what is this object? And then what does it tell us about environmental change? And so the idea was, is through the stories, is getting, um, it's, bringing, it's bringing that richness, it's bringing that narrative um, into the different objects. We also um, <laughs> try to pair the objects with the data, which it turned out um, is incredibly hard. Um, mm -hmm. Because in, in terms of this, it's, it's, there is such a thing as, as good and bad data. This is what we discovered. Um, and or that kind of what is interesting data from a data point of view may not be data that works with a piece of art. <laughs> And so, actually, from the point of view of the, the artworks, what worked better was kind of quite slow, steady data points where you could kind of see quite a clear, discernible trend over time, whereas data that's kind of, that's more kind of, that's less steady, that's more kind of jiggity-jaggity, for want of a better phrase, um, makes it a lot hard, kind of, it doesn't work well with the art because the, the objects were, um, were kind of distorting and reassembling in a way that wasn't visually pleasing, I think it would be fair to say. Um, we had three versions of the artwork and we changed it each time to kind of try and I suppose balance the the kind of what our artist wanted to do as an artist and what we wanted to do as that the rest of the team wanted to do as people who were engaging on climate change so this is so this is this is from the first iteration of the artwork and so although it was initially triggered by by movement in the space so as people entered the space then the artwork would 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 kind of would start would start doing its thing we didn't, it didn't have any explanations as to what the artwork was and what the data was associated with it. It, it was just kind of, it was a, a moving, a moving image. And although it was very beautiful from the feedback, I, I'm not sure anyone understood that this was about environmental change. So for the second iteration of the artwork, you can't see it very well, but we put a, there was a, sort of a bar that was put at the bottom so that says um broccoli uk for uk food imports by air so we were we were providing information about what the data set was that was that was causing the image to change um and that that did help with people's understanding of what was going on um but in terms of telling a story about the data we weren't quite there yet so in the third iteration there was then a, a kind of basically a bar that moved along the bottom. So at the same time as the picture of broccoli, say, was, was distorting, the data point was also being shown so that you, it gave you a more direct connection between the data and the artwork. Um, we did lots of evaluation. <laughs> so we, um, we sat in a corner each of the three days and we observed how people interacted with the artwork how long did they stay did they talk to each other did they um yeah 
their, their kind of interactions. We also used something called Thought Cloud, which was a, um, just a, an iPad on the way in and you, people voted as to what they thought about the artwork. And then we did interviews. So we did 22 interviews, sort of trying to unpack and find out a bit more about people's, people's experiences and what they thought about it. Um, and so then at, at each time, sort of for each iteration, we changed it based on the feedback from our audience. And so that's, our, that's from the Thought Cloud. Those are our ratings on, on day one. And we can see that actually most people thought it was OK. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Few people thought it was good. Some people thought it was great. Um, but it was through the interviews that most people thought it was OK because it wasn't particularly clear what was going on. Um, and so that's that's why it was kind of it was changed to make that clearer for on the second day and then ooh, on the by the third time when we'd made it really clear we were very happy to see that three quarters of the people who visited thought it was great um, so and why did people think it was great so that's a quote from an interview with someone who'd actually been been to see it three times <laughs> who'd been on each day and and so what he was saying here that actually by day three, we'd got it right in terms of it was clear what the relationships were between the objects and the data and that that interpretation was, was important. So, you know, the question we were interested in with this was can immersive artworks bring climate change to the here and now? Um, so it was in a museum and also the people who were prepared to be interviewed were the people who tended to be the ones who stayed longest with the artwork. It was kind of, there was no, yeah, I spent a lot of time with people who just kind of glanced into the room and then left, sort of trying to get them to give me an interview to sort of explain a bit why they didn't, what, you know, why they hadn't wanted to stay, but I got no, I, yeah, I got as far as it's not for me being the kind of general comment that people made. So. The data that we've got from the interviews are tended to be from people who were concerned about climate change, so they were an engaged audience. Um, however, even though they were an engaged audience already, I think it doesn't, um, that didn't mean to say that it didn't change the way they perceived things and thought about things. So what we were trying to do with the artwork was bring the past to now, in a sense, to try and overcome that, that kind of temporal distance. Um, and through the stories, so I suppose I should have said that might not. So for each of the images, you had the changing image, you had the data set, and then you had a st the story of the data set. And so um, most people uh, took a lot from those stories. And so it was through the stories that they were getting, you know, this sense of what the objects were. Um, we wanted to make climate change local. And again, that worked really well. Um, because again, here we were definitely people were learning things about Newcastle and about the northeast that they didn't know before. So I like this one. So we had a Roman pipe from Corbridge, which is um, in the northeast, and it used to be it was it was the centre of industry in in Roman Britain, for example. Um, so people were were kind of learning different things about their their kind of their area and the past that they didn't know before. It also, we were trying to make climate change personally irrelevant. And again, um, the stories helped that in the way that the kind of the objects and the data alone wouldn't have done. And the slow interactions, I think this is where things worked really well, actually. Um, and again, we learned. So by the end, for our, our third show, we kind of, we had cushions on on the floor and it was a very big wide open space and actually people did take you know when people came in they'd sit down they'd kind of lie on the cushions <coughs> and they very much kind of immerse themselves in in the artwork and that was true for kind of older people as well as as younger people and and children so some reflections so slow and immersive is engaging um i think it helped as well that dan that it, that it was beautiful. Um, you know, Dan's objects, many people were attracted and stayed. They didn't, they weren't attracted by the stories, but they were attracted by the slow moving, beautiful images that we had. And so that drew people in initially. And then it was kind of through the stories that that encouraged them to stay. And also the, the humanity, the kind of the personal aspects in the story. 
Um, so the, the kind of, because everyone who, who gave a story said what their name was, said what their job was, you kind of, you started, you were, people were associating the object with a person. And, and that kind of made the object far more, far more real and far more human. Um, the data, the data was an essential part of the thing because it was through the data that the objects changed. But actually the data was the hardest thing for people to make sense of and to think about. Um, <coughs> so uh, what did we need? So yeah, so kind of moving on, moving back to the, the kind of the way the artwork changed. Certainly in a museum, which I think is different to if our artwork had been in a gallery. Um, so context is key and you have to you have to design things for different people who like to engage in different ways. So we had some people who liked the story, we had some people who liked the images, and we had some people who liked the data. And actually, I think the best engagement allows for those different ways people learn, and that kind of, the fact that we're all different, we all, we all learn in different ways and we enjoy different things. So any one of those things on, it, on its own would have been a bit rubbish, um, but the three of them kind of meant that it, it was more complete as a whole. Uh, I think cross-sector collaborations produce novel ideas and artworks. Um, you know, what, what we would have done as scientists would have been very different to what we could do working with the museum and working with Dan. And my final point is, okay, you've engaged people, now what? And I think this is, this is where I'd like my next art project to go. So if there's anyone in the room um, who wants is fancies kind of talking a bit about this idea and this is the fact okay so what we've done is we've engaged people but we haven't provided that call to action we haven't provided the solutions that they can that they can tend to take away so what i'm really interested now in exploring is how can we move from the engagement to building that coalition to kind of to providing the solutions and promoting action on environmental change and that's the end. Um, there's lots of thank yous, uh, but hopefully you can read all the thank yous. And I apologise if there's anyone that I've left off. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>